Thank you. I'll Thank hand over you. to you. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm so excited to be here today um, and it's just nice to kind of be in a room with people in, in person again. So my name is Laura and I work here at the Devil's Courage Museum as a research officer. I was actually hired in January 2021 uh, to take the lead on this new research project that we were doing in which we wanted to find out more about the 30,000 people who worked at HM Factory Gretna in World War I. And before I came to the museum, uh, I was a research, I was research officer, I was a PhD student. Um, I, was, I finished my PhD at the Open University in 2021. Um, and my research focused on two women who were both suffrage activists and they were also early women lawyers. Um, so I'm also disabled. Um, I have hypermobility spectrum disorder, which is a condition that's often associated with and is kind of referred to under the umbrella of Elos Danlos syndrome, which I can never say right. Um, and basically, for me, my hypermobility involves semi frequent joint subluxations, which are kind of partial dislocations of the joints. Um, sorry if anybody's squeamish. <laughs> um, um, uh, and it, I have a quite pretty near much constant chronic, chronic pain that can kind of vary from manageable to staying in bed all day and crying. Um, I try not to do that, though, as much as possible. Um, and I also have this thing called brain fog, um, which I know that a lot of people with disabilities uh, um, have as well. And actually, I, <laughs> this was completely unintentional, but I was having a bit of a flare-up when I wrote this presentation. So if you spot any um, spelling mistakes, totally brain fog and not me having bad grammar. Um, so HSD is sometimes classed as an invisible disability. So um, if you look at me today, you wouldn't know that I have a disability. Um, however, um, depending on the day and how bad my condition is, and if I'm in a flare-up, I have my trusty walking stick. I also have supports that I use. Sometimes when flare-ups are really bad in the past, I've used um, a wheelchair. So yes, that's just a little something about me, and that's a photo of me pretending to stare at things in the museum for a promotional image. <laughs> and I, I got told off actually at this point because I was looking too cheery, and our museum is about World War I, so you can't look too cheery about war. Um, so a little bit about the Devil's Porridge Museum. So we started 25 years ago. Um, we began as a small exhibition in a church, and the porridge is really a community venture. Um, a team of dedicated volunteers collected items. There was only professional museum staff, I think, from 2015 onwards. So we have a very small team of office-based employees, um, but the majority of the team are volunteers, and they comprise trustees, front of house staff and researchers. And we tell the history of HM Factory Gretna, which is the, the, a quote that we use on our website, is the greatest munitions factory on earth. And it was actually built during World War I, um, transforming our area of southwest Scotland from a very kind of rural area to this kind of massive uh, factory complex alongside two massive townships that were also built. We also have a World War II exhibition and information about nearby Chapel Cross Nuclear Power Station, which was the first power station in Scotland. So, to give you a brief feel of just the museum and the history we talk, we talk about before I get on to my, the main gist of my argument today, um, so this is, uh, I'm going to show you a couple of archive photos that we have in our collection. And this photo pretty much demonstrates why we're called the Devil's Porridge Museum. Um, and <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've had to pop downstairs to have people come in who have just seen the sign on the street and thought we are actually a museum about porridge and have got <laughs> extremely disappointed when they discover we're not. Um, and we don't even serve it in our cafe, which I think we're missing a bit of a trick on that. <laughs> um, so basically, when um, in, in World War I, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who created Sherlock Holmes, was a war correspondent, and he came and visited loads of munitions factories in England, and when he came to Scotland to visit the uh, HM Factory Gretna, he saw this, uh, which is women pouring nitro cotton into a larger porridge pot, as they're called, um, and he said, oh, we're in Scotland, and that looks like porridge, so it's porridge, but it's going to go off and kill people, so I'm going to call it the devil's porridge, um, and that is how this got its name as the Devil's Porridge, and we got our name as the museum. Um, so 30,000 people came and worked at the factory during the war. 12,000 of them were women. And we have lots of photos like this in our collection that were taken at a photography studio. They're in their uniform, they've got their little mop hats on, they've got their on-war service badges. 
Um, and this just kind of shows the variety of work done at the factory. So we have people who were working with the porridge, it, it, like mixing the nitro cotton together, people who were taking cotton all around this massive site. It was nine miles by two, and it stretched across the English and Scottish border. So it was humongous. Um, so yes, that was just a brief kind of summary of the porridge and uh, the museum and, and where, what we tell. So disabled people within the heritage sector... So according to government statistics, um, there's 14.1 million people are disabled, and that's a significant proportion of our um, population. And if anybody's interested in any of the stats that I used in this presentation, I do have them, so I can, if you want my email address, I can email them over to you. Um, so despite this, recent data suggests that museum visitors who return are much less likely to not have a disability. Um, and it implies that there's a substantial kind of gap in disability engagement in people with disabilities going to museums and feeling like they can go. Um, so the corona pandemic has only kind of made this, made this worse. Ewan's Guide um, re survey reported that during COVID that 39% of respondents were less likely to visit predominantly indoor or covered attractions such as museums. Um, and in addition to this, disabled people are almost twice as likely as non-disabled people to be out of work, and this is reflected within heritage as well. Um, so I don't need to spend too long on this slide, because I think we all know what happened <laughs> over the last couple of years. So obviously, March 2020, we went into the first of um, quite a few national lockdowns. Things closed, in including museums and heritage sites. Um, so... I was hired at the Porridge in January 2021 when we were in the middle of, I think, the second national lockdown. Um, and I actually worked exclusively remotely for four months, um, which was challenging, definitely challenging, because I, never, I didn't sort of interact with my colleagues in the way that I was, thought I was going to. And because I was so far away, it was, it, was a, it was a bit of an interesting situation. I was actually interviewed by, um, I think it was ITV Look North, and they said, they were like, what's the museum like? And I, I had to be honest and say, I'm sure it's great, but I've never actually been. Um, and I'd been working there for a good couple of months at that time. Um, so I worked exclusively remotely for months, and I eventually managed to get to the museum actually a year ago, um, sort of in May last year. Um, and, but working remotely, although there were these challenges, I found that it was really kind on my body. For me, with, with, I've got to be very careful. If I do too much on one day, I might have to spend the next couple of days in bed. Um, so the fact that I shifted from this sort of PhD life to nine to five, but could do it remotely, made that shift much easier. This was me on my first day in the actual museum uh, with a very cheesy grin um, in front of uh, the Mossbank clock. So... The project that I was hired on um, was developed because we actually know very little about the people behind the factory. We know a lot about the processes and how to make cordite and all of that fun stuff, but less about the people who actually staff the factory and their life and their stories and how working at this massive factory changed their life. Um, so I was actually hired um, and to, as on this Miracle Workers project. And our, our aim was to find out more about these people. And we were going to do that through recruiting and working with volunteers to research these workers. And we wanted to then use this research to turn that into an exhibition and a conference. Um, and we also turned it into a sort of short documentary, 20-minute documentary film as well. And then the final output of our project is a, was to have a database. We, there was no kind of database of munitions workers and we constantly had people emailing or phoning or coming in and saying my great aunt worked at the factory and they show us a picture of her in her uniform or they show us a bit of like something that, that, that's a, a memento of that time in her life. And we wanted to put all of the information that we've had from visitors in the past and sort of that are coming in now and put that online so that people, researchers, family members, anybody in the world could say, oh, I, I think this person worked at the factory. Type it on in the database, and if they're on there, they can see what we know about them, and if they're not, they can email me and I'll add them to the database. However, COVID meant that we really had to reconfigure this project because we'd applied for funding, the museum had applied for funding before COVID. So... It was initially very much intended to be physical in nature in terms of we wanted volunteers to be in the museum, working together, working very closely with our collections and archive objects, 
um, using our computers in our education room to kind of do that research and turn that research into things like blogs and articles. Um, however, this, this was completely impossible, particularly for the first couple of months when we were in a total lockdown. So instead of putting the project on hold for a bit, we decided to kind of reimagine it as remote. So we use platforms such as Zoom, Facebook, and Google Drive to share resources and training. And we implemented this change almost immediately. We launched our project on Zoom, and we delivered it, and delivered um, research training on Zoom. So how we implemented this was kind of a four a four-stage thing. We, we had online access to online research websites like Ancestry, Find My Past, Scotland's People, Forces War Records, and our, our um, volunteers had access to those websites through our logins, uh, which was great. It meant that people could be researched really, really easily. Uh, we did Zoom training sessions on how to do historical research, how to turn that research into maybe a blog post or an article or something like that. Um, and we recorded them and put them on our YouTube channel so that they could also be replayed if necessary or watched back or people who um, maybe missed the sessions could then go and watch them. We, sorry, this is again, I'm blaming that on my brain fog because I should have had put, put that a little bit further down. So we digitised, we, um, our museum manager at the time, Judith, bless her, digitised as much of our archive material as possible. So she sent them all over to me and then I uploaded them onto Google Drive, which meant that our volunteers, whether they be from Australia or the US, could go on Google Drive and see the Moss Band Farewell or an autograph book or anything like that. Um, and that really helped as well because it allowed the volunteers to really get a feel of the museum. Um, and we also were really keen to establish a communication um, and community. So we have a closed Facebook group for all of our volunteers, whether that they are volunteering remotely or in person. And if somebody has a research question, they put it on there. If somebody's like, I found this really funny thing in a newspaper, they put it on there. I think my favourite thing that one of our volunteers Fiona found was um, when the factory was being sold off in the 1920s, she found that, um, uh, an advert for, for selling 150 pairs of waterproof knickers um, that belonged to the government, and they were described as white and drab, which isn't very appealing in my, in my uh, opinion. So yes, yeah, so those were the kind of key sort of stepping stages to how we implemented it. Um, and how this went. So this is a picture of what we also, um, part of this project, which I didn't mention before, was um, Wiki, Wikipedia and Wikimedia. So Wikipedia, most of the articles are written by men and about men. And obviously such a large proportion of our workers were women. Um, and we really wanted to kind of increase that representation of women on Wikipedia. So a lot of the thing, a lot of the times that we did research and we found like a particularly interesting and notable person, we'd then have these wikithons where we work with volunteers to put people on Wikipedia, which was very fun. So that was a little aside. Uh, so because remote working and using Zoom and, and ordering your food shop online, having it delivered, had become really prevalent. The transition from in-person to virtual was actually pretty seamless. I was quite surprised. A few volunteers needed a little bit of extra support and extra help, but because we were already communicating via email and via phone and via Zoom a lot, we could easily provide that support just by a quick call if somebody was struggling logging on or asking a question on the Facebook page, etc. And because this volunteering was remote, more people, not just the normal local pool of people, took part. So we had volunteers from as far afield as Australia and the US, which was fascinating because, especially with Australia, a lot of the workers actually emigrated to Australia after war, so they were able to access other archives that maybe we wouldn't have access to. Um, and the virtual nature also meant that this project was far more accessible than previous projects the museum had put on. Volunteers were able to work flexibly from home at their own pace. And it was really interesting how, as we were doing the project and as I was working remotely, I kind of realised that they were almost parallel to each other in that it was, it was, it, it, there, there were some benefits to that remote and digital work in that it did make it more accessible. So, lockdown lifted, which was all very exciting. Um, so, our success during lockdown encouraged us to continue the project on a kind of hybrid basis. We did not want to, after putting in months of work and sort of building that community and having a real kind of, yeah, having the success of it, to let that go. And also, I think it was, I think it was important for 
many of the volunteers that that continued on that basis as well. So we allowed, this is Beth, um, and she's looking at our, our physical copies of the Annandale Observer, which we hold in our collections. So what we kind of did is, we, if, if you were local or if you were going to pop in, because we had quite a few people actually who are remote volunteers who've now visited us, um, you could come and pop in and like, see the collections and all of this fun stuff. But we were still doing the online drop-ins, the online socials, the online groups, everything, everything that was available, hopefully, to um, in-person volunteers was also... We tried to digitise that to make it available online. Um, so I'd also really made it to Scotland, which was really exciting, and I was now commuting to the museum five days a week from nine to five. This is a very posy and grumpy picture of me with uh, my walking stick. <laughs> um, and so basically the switch from re working remotely to working in the museum was pretty hard initially on my symptoms. Um, I found myself having more frequent flare-ups, having dislocations at work, which is never fun, um, needing to use my mobility aids or supports more often, and then I'd also, I noticed I'd have to spend the entire weekend in bed to recover to then work Monday to Friday the next week. Uh, and I realised soon that this wasn't sustainable, but I was really nervous. This was my first ever job in museums, and I was worried that my colleagues would think I was slacking somehow or that I was kind of, yeah, just not putting in a full effort. And I actually don't think, I've, speak, I've spoken to a couple of uh, friends who are disabled and I think that's a pretty common fear for many disabled employees um, because many of us push ourselves so hard to almost be less of a nuisance. Like I, uh, with my um, condition, it's very much boom and bust. So I tend to push myself, I'm trying not to, but I tend to push myself and push myself and push myself. Then I have a really bad dislocation and can't do anything. And then you feel like you need to put that effort in again to show that you are yeah, as, as valuable as an employee. So thankfully, and sort of really, yeah, brilliantly, the team at the Porridge were really understanding and accommodating. So I worked together with the manager at the time, Judith, to draw up a risk plan and a working plan that allowed me to really thrive in my job. And it included things like working from home one day a week, so this that helped me rest my joints, I didn't have to drive, um, and that lowered my frequency of dislocations. Working from home when my hypermobility is flaring up. I actually worked from home most of last week because I had a bit of a flare up. And again, this helped in my recovery time, and it was less of that pressure to be like, oh, I need to get back to work because I was at work. I was just working from my sofa. Um, and I also let volunteers know about my condition. I'm pretty open about it because I'm always wary of the fact that people are not, not used to seeing a girl just randomly fall on the floor and scream in pain, and I'd rather them know about that before it happens. Um, and again, that really helped because it made them aware. They knew that I wasn't taking out. They knew that I was working from home, and, and it just, yeah, it just really helped. Um, and I, after kind of putting together this plan and having worked um, at the museum for a while, I, I realised that the plan is very specific to my disability and how that disability affects me. And I think that's the, that's the point of plans like this, is that it needs to be tailored to people. It needs to be reflective and responsive to their condition at that point. And whatever kind of... That, that needs to be individualised, basically. So, what we've learned... So we've learned a lot. Um, I think the impact of virtual working, volunteering, conferences, meetings cannot be underestimated. It just means that there's that option to, there's that, 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 that you don't push yourself as much because you know that you can attend virtually and that's brilliant. Um, and having the virtual option, events are more accessible. Those who maybe have mobility issues like me would be able to attend. Um, and by embracing this, this virtual kind of working and virtual volunteering, museums can reach audiences and engage volunteers and employees that they never would have before. It would have been almost impossible to, to volunteer at the porridge if you lived in Cambridge or something. Um, and this allows for a much more diverse audience and volunteer group. Some of our volunteers um, on the Miracle Work Project have, like me, mobility issues. And so they wouldn't have volunteered if it had, had to been an in-person museum thing. Um, and this stretches, I think, to other marginalised groups as well, groups who are also represented in heritage. Um, and fourthly, um, on a kind of personal note, I realised that I am an asset um, and that asking for adjustments because I'm disabled is completely reasonable and that it, it shouldn't be a scary thing. Um, and I've also recognised that more needs to be done in terms of engaging disabled people within heritage and increasing the number of disabled workers in our sector. So, what next? I'm nearly done. I don't know whether I've gone over, but I'm nearly... <laughs> um, so, 
The work on our Miracle Workers project has directly inspired our next research project. So as we researched, we found out more about these people that came to this massive factory. We realised that a significant number of them were disabled and or chronically ill. Um, either because a lot of the men uh, came to Gretna to kind of do their bit because they, they were invalided out of the army. And a lot of the women suffered from chronic illnesses that affected their breathing and life after the factory. Um, so that kind of, it, this kind of untold history that had never really been tapped into before really came to light during this project. And I think part of the reason why we identified that untapped story was because we were remote, we were working, people, people who were disabled were working on this project. So we applied for and were awarded very generous funding by Museums Gallery Scotland to investigate this untold history more thoroughly. Um, and this disability history, as I'm sure you guys will know, is very under-researched, so we're really hoping that this project contributes to the amazing work already done in that field. However, we were very keen for this project to be two-pronged. So under, alongside this disability history work that we were doing, we also uh, recognised the fact that disabled people aren't visiting museums as much as non-disabled people and aren't working in the sector as much as non-disabled people. So we've undertaken things like an accessibility audit, which is happening at the moment, to see what we can approve, what we can improve on in our displays, in our museum building, to make things as, as accessible as possible for people with lots of different disabilities. Um, and we've also, uh, we, uh, with the Disability History Project, we are, we've just put online, actually, our, our internship. Um, where we are going to offer a paid internship over this summer to a disabled or chronically ill person who wants to work in heritage, um, where they can work on um, the disability history project, and it's going to be completely flexible in terms of if they, if they really like curatorial stuff, collection stuff, they can do that. If they're into research, they can do that. If they're into education, they can do that. We just really want to kind of mentor and help and support a person who's disabled or chronically ill to get into our sector. Um, so, it, 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 it's, it's really kind of, the, the whole kind of argument of my presentation, I would say that uh, remote and digital working really makes things more accessible, is kind of directly fed into our latest project, because we're still doing, we're doing a research that is done by remote researchers, and our internship can be remote as well. So it's really kind of feeding in, and we're starting to see some sort of change that will hopefully continue and um, grow. So thank you for listening, um, and have you got any questions? <laughs>